Hello, everyone. It's Congressman Jamie Raskin coming at you from Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District in Montgomery and Frederick and Carroll counties. Uh, welcome to our fourth annual Federal Employee Health Benefits Forum. Uh, open season uh, has begun or is beginning uh, November 9th through December 14th. Uh, so thank you for joining our forum. This is an annual event. We usually uh, host in person. It's one of my favorite events. However, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we're hosting it virtually this year. We miss uh, all of our uh, wonderful friends from Maryland NARF and the representatives from the insurance providers who usually uh, hang out in the back of the room and talk to people, uh, as well as all of our friends at the Holiday Park Senior Center who've uh, previously been able to join us in person uh, and host us over at the Senior Center. And we really look forward to being again with uh, everybody together soon. Um, we've got uh, extraordinary panelists this year, James Marshall, who is one of the federal benefits specialists uh, at NARF. James, thanks for being with us. We've got uh, Ed DeHard, uh, who's uh, Assistant Director of uh, Healthcare and Insurance uh, with the Federal Employees Insurance Operations at the Office of personnel management, uh, OPM. Actually, Ed, is, it's Ed DeHardy, right? Ed DeHardy, yes, sir. Thanks. Ed DeHardy, right, so we gotta pronounce the final E. Ed DeHardy, okay, thank you, Ed, for joining us. And Walt Francis, who is uh, a prominent consultant and author uh, with uh, Washington Consumer Checkbook's Guide to Health Plans for Federal Employees, just what we need. So uh, before we start, I wanted to just quickly update all of my friends on some um, recent uh, items of interest to uh, members of the federal workforce. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I think I shared the outrage of a lot of my constituents by President Trump's recent executive order to gut the federal service as we know it by creating a new patronage class of, uh, class of federal employees and undermining civil service protections for existing federal workers. Uh, and as a member of the Oversight Committee and the Government Operations Subcommittee, uh, who represents more than 80,000 federal workers. Uh, I am working to defeat this very dangerous effort to politicize uh, the civil service and to entrench uh, existing political appointees. I've joined with uh, my friend uh, Jerry Conley from Virginia, who's the chair of our subcommittee in introducing legislation to block this dangerous effort. And our bill is called the Saving the Civil Service Act. It would prevent uh, any funding from going uh, to President Trump's executive order. Um, and we would be able to return uh, any position that was converted politically back to its original civil service status. Um, and uh, we have uh, also urged um, the OPM and OMB to halt any implementation of this uh, unlawful executive order. Secondly, um, I uh, also had to oppose President Trump's efforts to try to make the federal workforce a guinea pig for the absurd payroll tax deferral scheme, uh, which would stick 1.3 million federal workers with significant and sudden unexpected tax obligations in 2021. The administration insisted that it's implementing the deferral to give employees relief as quickly as possible. Um, well, if it's for the benefit of the workers, give people the choice about whether they want that kind of relief. And I've been uh, arguing strongly for that. And I was proud to lead a letter uh, with all of my national capital region colleagues and urging the administration to uh, make this so-called tax deferral or relief program optional rather than mandatory for federal workers. On the federal pay raise, you know my strong belief that federal workers des deserve a pay raise. Currently, uh, members of the military are set to receive a 3% pay increase compared to the 1% for civilian federal workers uh, detailed in uh, President Trump's budget proposal. Um, I have joined with a bipartisan group of members to urge appropriators to match the 2021 pay increase um, for civilian uh, federal employees to the raise given to the servicemen and women proposed in the FY21 uh, NDAA, the Defense Authorization Act. So we want to keep the civilian and the military pay uh, uh, raises equal and equivalent going forward. Uh, and I'm a proud co-sponsor, as you know, of the FAIR Act 
which would provide federal employees a 3.5% pay increase in 2021. And finally, um, I have continued to fight attacks on official time. I wrote a letter that was joined by 185 members uh, to oppose the EEOC's proposed rule that would make it more difficult for unionized federal workers to obtain effective representation during the EOC employment discrimination complaint process. Uh, EOC's proposed rule, which was opened for a second public comment period, prohibits federal workers from participating in a union or who are participating in a union from using official time to assist or represent their colleagues in employer discrimination complaints. But this is the process that we've had for many decades. It works, it's efficient. Um, and uh, official time should not be undercut and undermined in this way. So I continue to uh, champion the interests and the values and the priorities of the federal workforce, as you know. But to the business at hand, um, again, uh, welcoming everybody to our uh, Federal Employee Health Benefit Forum. And I'm going to uh, kick off the agenda by turning it over to James Marshall from NARP. James, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you, Congressman Raskin. Um, and also thank you for fighting for the rights and the benefits, the hard earned benefits of both federal employees and federal retirees. I appreciate that and so does NARF. Uh, for those of you uh, who might have missed the very beginning, I'm with the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. I'm one of their federal benefits specialists who uh, work with people, both employed and retired folks, just helping them understand how their decisions about various federal benefits work, whether it's retirement benefits or employee benefits or somewhere in between. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with NARF, you can always go to the following website. It's www.narfe.org. Again, that's narfe.org. That's the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. Um, just like we do every year, we've got our webinars up and running. One of the questions when it comes to health care, uh, especially for folks who are retired and 65 or older, is always that old question, to be or not to be? You know, do I need Medicare Part B? I've got federal health trunks. What good is Medicare? And if I get Medicare, what good is my federal health trunks? So great conversations. We've got webinars on that. As a matter of fact, we did one just last uh, on the 22nd of October. Uh, that's available for our members to watch uh, anytime they want. We got one coming up this week that I'm conducting, and I'll actually uh, share some of that information with you over the next few minutes about which FEHB plan is right for you. And it's going to be focused on both employees and retirees because we have a third webinar, which is next week, is if you have Medicare Parts A and B, which is original Medicare, what are some of the better FEHB plans? And I'm certain that either Ed and or Walt will probably say a few words about all these new things that are coming out. For 2021 because I do see the word advantage on a lot more plans this year coming up than I did uh, last year so I'm certain they're gonna say some words about that uh, but we do have a whole webinar dedicated next week to that so anybody interested in any of those webinars you can always go to the NARF website and register for any of them and when you do uh, you get a whole year subscription but you also have people like me that you can contact at NARF uh, when you just need a little one-on-one -on -one conversation about your situation in regards to any federal benefits you know we're here for you um, so uh, for those of you who are still employed, you know, during the open season, you definitely want to take advantage of those health care and dependent care flexible spending accounts if you can, reduce your taxable income. For the rest of us, uh, whether we're employed or retired, you know, we want to start thinking about is the FEHP plan we have right now, the federal health trends plan, the best to have next year, you know, because there are a lot of new things coming out. Uh, so we want to take a closer look at that. Um, but also for those of us who have that Medicare as primary, you know, do I need to consider switching to a less expensive yet still comprehensive plan if I've got Medicare paying for the majority of my hospital and doctor bills and I just need something to take care of what Medicare doesn't cover? Uh, so we're, we spend a lot of time in that webinar next week doing that. Um, so, but once you have your health trends figured out, you know, so there are some health trends plans that have some pretty decent dental or vision benefits, but there's some that don't. So if you end up moving to a plan that doesn't or isn't going to meet your uh, dental or vision insurance needs, I'm certain that both Ed and Walt will probably say a few words about this. There's a bunch of new plans coming out. I think there's uh, at least 10 new dental plans, uh, and I think there's at least six new uh, vision plans that are coming out next year. Uh, I mean, for this upcoming open season to look at. So that means competition, and I think competition is a good thing. So we'll have to see. I'm certain Ed and, and Walt will say a few words about that. But what I'll do real quick, uh, just for the few minutes I've got left, is I'm going to go through some questions that everybody should ask themselves or at least get the answers to. 
uh, before they switch plans. Um, this is true whether you're employed or retired from federal service. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why these questions are important, then I'll be done here. All right, let me just jump here. This is part of the presentation I'm doing later this week, actually. So one of the questions is, is this health insurance plan going to help me save money if I'm healthy? Because a lot of times, if you're in the Cadillac plans and you're paying a lot of money for the more expensive FHP plans, but if you're not taking advantage of all the benefits they have because you're just going to the doctor once a year for your annual checkups, you know, you might be a little bit overinsured and it might be worth giving a test drive for one of those less expensive yet still comprehensive plans that might meet your needs. So again, you want to think about that. You know, what about the, the next question, which is related, you know, will this health insurance plan be affordable if I'm sick? You know, because sometimes when you're in the lower option plan, sometimes your sh cost of the, uh, the co-pays or deductibles could be going up a little bit. You know, sometimes you get what you pay for, right? But again, you know, there's different seasons we all go through. And for those of us who are married with kids, you know, we've all got different situations. Sometimes we've got kids that are still playing sports or sometimes there's those, those of us jumping out of airplanes, flying helicopters. So we have the health trends uh, that we have for a reason. But I do encourage you because they're always improving various health trends plans and because there really isn't a bad plan available that sometimes if you just take a little bit of time every open season to take a look at other plans, just maybe two or three, and use the tools either on the OPM website or the Consumer Checkbook Guide to narrow your choices down to those two or three, you might very well uh, find a plan that's maybe something that you haven't had before and give it a test drive. And guess what you can do next open season if 12 months later you hated it? You can always go back to the old plan. Another question is, are my doctors covered by this plan? That's very important for many of you who, especially if you've got those doctors that you've been seeing for decades, you know, before you switch plans, you, know, you might just want to call the doctor and say, look, I'm thinking about switching to this plan and find out if they accept that plan. Because uh, sometimes you can go to the plan's website and see if the doctor's in network, but that doesn't mean that doctor isn't planning to get out of that network. So you want to be mindful about that. Sometimes you want to call those doctors directly. Um, same thing with hospitals. And prescription drug coverage, for those of you who have a lot of uh, prescriptions, you definitely always want to keep that in mind because chances are whatever FEHP plan you decide to go to, that's where you're going to be getting the bulk of your prescriptions unless you've got something like military health trunks like TRICARE. Another question, will it be easy for me to um, get care if I'm sick under this insurance plan? And that's maybe not such a big deal for people in major metropolitan areas, but for those of you living out in the rural area, before you decide to switch plans, you definitely want to make sure that the hospitals and the doctors that you can go visit are going to be easy uh, to access. You don't necessarily want to drive 200 miles every time you want to see a doctor. Another question, will it be easy to get care if I'm well under this insurance plan? So what does that mean? Hey, James. Well, you know, oh, yeah. Forgive me. Can I ask you a quick question about that? Yeah, sure. So, when you're talking about like my rural constituents who are trying to decide which plan uh, to, to go on, is there a way that they can go online just to see local hospitals and doctors or do you have to actually start calling all the different providers yeah each you know first of all when you use either the opm website or the consumer checkbook guide website people are going to first type in their zip code to see the option of plans that are available but when they want to really look at the networks they're going to you know narrow their choices down to the plans they're really looking at and when you go to the actual plans website and matter of fact waltz tools and the OPM tool do, do a pretty good job of linking you right to the actual plans website. You can actually use their online tools where they'll tell you what hospitals and what doctors are in their network. And it's really nice. You can usually type in the names and it just pops right up and you can say, yep, that's my doctor in there, part of that network. And so people can also, whenever they travel a lot, they often call us up, say, hey, James, I'm going to Mexico. How do I find out, you know, if I get you know, injured and it, or it's not an emergency. If I'm going to be spending six months in Mexico, how do I find a good network of doctors? I say, call that toll free number on the back of your, uh, you know, your FEHB plan card. And they'll tell you what hospitals and doctors would be the best ones to go to if you needed to go see a doctor while in a different place. And that's not just overseas, but that could also be in the States, you know, especially if someone has an HMO, there are some HMOs that do have partnerships in other States. And sometimes they can, uh, you know, find something nearby that would still be maybe be considered a network if they have a partnership with that other HMO. Um, did I help with that question? All right. So just a few other questions would be, um, you know, there are a lot of plans that have wellness programs. So maybe you're just the type of person that goes to the doctor once a year, but there might be some other benefits, um, especially whenever it comes to, uh, you know, you know, regular things like immunizations, flu shots, you know, you want to uh, double check. Sometimes you don't need an expensive plan if that's all you're you're getting. Uh, so another question is, are there any extra perks? I believe it's section five and Ed can confirm what he gets online here. 
Um, section five of every plan brochure talks about other things, other benefits that you might not have thought or associated with that plan, like gym memberships and stuff. So certainly, and there's some programs, wellness programs, where they actually give you cash money to do certain things, like a little checklist, you know, join a gym membership or get your annual exam or get these other things done. And some of these, you know, like I said, these health trust plans will pay cash money for these things called wellness programs. So will this health insurance plan still be right for me if my change need or my needs change? Uh, so again, that's something that can always happen, which is why it's always important to know what the catastrophic limit is for any particular plan. What's the most you would have to pay? You know, what's, you know, if, if you had a, something that just came up that you weren't expecting. Uh, for those of you who are 65 or older and retired, by the way, if that ever happens to you once in your <clears> life, <throat> you have the ability to contact OPM and switch your health trust plans mid-year if you needed to switch for any emergency reason. Once, though, just save that. Don't just waste it if there's an upcoming open season nearby uh, to make a plan. I think there's just one last question. Is it easy to get support and advice with this plan? One way to find out is call the customer service reps at those toll-free numbers at the particular plans, um, you know, with the using the tools, OPM's website and the consumer checkbook guide, and call them and see what kind of assistance you get. You know, what kind of answers are you getting when you ask those questions? Uh, and when you get those people on the phone, you know, they're there to help you. And but if they're not really giving you straight answers, then maybe that's not the best plan for you to have. Because the last thing you want is start dealing with medical problems and not having a good customer service support system there, you know, from that plan. But that's about it. I mean, there's a lot more in our webinars that we're covering, but uh, I don't want to hold take up any more time than we have to. But uh, uh, Congressman Raskin, I'll just hand it back to you. Great. Uh, James, thank you very much. That was uh, very illuminating. Uh, we'll go to Ed DeHarty now, who is the Assistant Director for Healthcare and Insurance in the Federal Employees Insurance Operations uh, Division at the Office of Personnel Management at OPM. Ed, turn it over to you for 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. And um... What James was referring there, it, it, it's called the non-FEHB benefits of the plans. That's actually not part of our contract, but those are uh, items that plans offer to, to those that are in the FEHB program, and, and people can find value there. And, and in our discussion on the networks, it's a very good thing. People want to look at quality. We have quality information on our website in addition to cost information. So in terms of the customer service metrics, some of that's out on the website, not just in, in, in what you, you know, anecdotally find when you call them. We have actually metrics where surveys have revealed how those plans are performing. But after, after one looks at the quality, looks at the cost, you wanna to talk to the doctors that you're, that you're seeing and you wanna ask them, are you in this network? What is your experience with this plan? How do you feel about this plan? And you wanna call the plan you might be switching to or joining and ask them to verify that that doctor's in network as well. You, you, can't, you can't really overthink that. But I'm, I'm gonna speak, uh, it's great that the, the, the stuff that James uh, provided there was as usual exemplary. And um, Walton may have some guidance to individuals in terms of what health plan might be right for them. I, I can't do that. I can't tell people what they ought to enroll in. I can tell them what they ought to look at and um, I can say that there's no bad choices in our program, but I'm gonna speak more, more broadly, thematically, and on policy directions and where we're going with the program. So the open season <clears throat> does begin today, November 9, and it runs through uh, midnight on December the 14th, but you don't wanna wait. At the last minute, you know, if, if we, we have our, our, our uh, metrics of website activity, and right at the last minute, it goes up like this. Um, that can, that can cause all, all manner of problems, not just for our administration, but, but for you, the enrollee, trying to make a choice. So get in there, shop early, look around, cogitate about it. If you make a change early in the open season and you change your mind, you can undo that change as long as open season is not over, but you wanna get in there and shop. So the annual open season gives federal employees and other eligible individuals the opportunity to review their plans, make changes, and enroll in coverage if you're an active employee and have not been enrolled before. This is also the time for annuitants to reevaluate their plans and decide if they are optimally covered. OPM encourages everyone to ensure that they have the right health, right dental or vision plan, and that they have also looked at the FSA feds if they're eligible. That's only for active employees. In our benefit and rate negotiation for the 2021 plan year, 
OPM has continued to focus on offering quality health, dental, and vision benefits to federal employees, annuitants, and other eligible members. The overall average increase in rates this year for non-postal employees, which is the lion's share of employees, is 3.6%. But, but any individual enrollee does not have to have 3.6% premium increase. You need to look at the value and at the plans that are available to you. And every year we have an announced premium increase. And every year the actual premium increase after enrollee movement is somewhat lower than that where people make prudent choices. Um, we would like for more people to make choices um, we, we continually have a challenge <clears throat> with getting people to shop and, and, and getting them to make the most, the most optimum value. And that's a good thing. That means they're happy with what they have, but we may have better things out there to offer you. Um, so in the FEHB program this year, we're looking to provide quality health benefits, I already said, through informed consumer choice, market competition, and a sustained focus on meeting healthcare needs. We're continuing to use our plan performance assessment paradigm, which we came up with uh, four or five years ago. We're, we're utilizing um, quantitative metrics, HEDIS and CAPS measures to review plan performance and to reward them based on objective metrics to ensure you get the best quality. Um, from a matter of policy, um, we're focusing on key topics, which we had also focused on last year. They include overuse of opioids, transparency in healthcare costs, greater decision tool support, reductions in surprise billing, lowering prescription drug costs, and increasing the appropriate use of telehealth, which is especially important as we're all going through this unprecedented pandemic. Regarding opioids, OPM has taken an active role over the years in combating the opioid epidemic among the federal population by asking FEHB and FedBIT plans to put in place programs and processes to prevent opioid misuse, manage pain effectively, treat opioid addiction, and support recovery. These efforts are just the latest step in a longstanding administration effort to end the opioid crisis. And I can tell you, um, I think even as far back as 2014, we did newsletters uh, and engagement with the plans on this, and we have seen um, fairly good reductions in uh, the number of opioids prescribed, and we've seen more appropriate utilization. Transparency. <clears throat> As part of our longstanding effort to improve plan quality and affordability, OPM has focused efforts this year on increasing access to and the quality of transparency tools offered by the FEHB carriers to help federal enrollees find and understand their benefits and make decisions. Beginning in 2021, all plans are required to offer robust cost and quality transparency tools. For decision support, we've already mentioned our plans comparison tool. We can't mention it enough. You can find it on the OPM website, opm.gov. And we're continuing to enhance it. Um, we have an additional feature this year um, that allows an easier evaluation of the uh, HDHP and CDHP plans, high deductible health plans and consumer driven health plans. <clears throat> Surprise billing. In last year's annual call letter, OPM instructed carriers that by no later than calendar year 2022, they are expected to display the network contracting status of selected specialties of physicians, physician groups, or categories of services that provide emergent or urgent care services in a hospital. This would include pathology, radiology, anesthesiology, et cetera. They must, they must indicate this on their websites to help enrollees and other consumers determine whether the provider is in network or out of network to aid in the reduction of su surprise bills that then may ensue. Um, on prescription drugs, <clears throat> our plans are continuing at our urging to um, invoke utilization management on, on existing drugs and processes to manage specialty medication, which a lot of these specialty medications are newly uh, approved FDA drugs or new indications, which can be <clears throat> unbelievably expensive. And uh, we're putting in controls to make sure these are appropriately uh, prescribed and utilized. And uh, I, I can't urge um, the enrollees enough, all of them, to discuss with their providers 
the, the best value or the most cost-effective medication. And if there is a generic av available, by all means, um, ask to have the generic. On telehealth, which is very important now, carriers have been encouraged for the 2020 and 2021 plan years to increase coverage for telehealth services, including waiving cost sharing in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll talk more about the pandemic shortly, but increasing telehealth coverage under FEHB has been a focus of ours for over four years. Nationally, um, I know most people here are concerned with locally, but nationally, we, this year we have 276 health plan choices, 18 fee-for-service plan choices that are open to all, four fee-for-service plan choices open to specific groups, 254 HMO plan choices nationwide. Um, here in the D.C. area, I'm looking for my note on that. Here in the D.C. area, we have 21 local plan options in addition to the 18 fee-for-service options. And I believe, and Walt will correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have one uh, new plan option in the D.C. area. Um, Medicare is something people always ask about a great deal at these forums. And uh, we have asked our carriers to continue to address and respond to the needs of our annuitants who also have Medicare. There are FEHB plan choices that offer additional benefits for those with Medicare, either through copay, coinsurance, or deductible waivers, or Part B premium reimbursements. The FEHB plan comparison tool, again, makes this information more readily available to enrollees and identifies plan choices with the Medicare Part B incentives. The, PT, the PCT features a Medicare display that allows individuals to see exactly what they're expected to pay if they have both Medicare A and B as their primary coverage and FEHB as their secondary coverage. But, yeah. And that, that comparison tool is on the um, OPM website? Yes. Okay. Yes. And um, I believe uh, today is the first day of open season. And as with anything, IT related, there, there are pitfalls and, 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 and things that, that are continually worked on, but uh, I, I believe it is up. Okay, I, I, okay. Um, okay there, there are additional plan options that will now offer reimbursement for part or all of an enrollee's Medicare Part B premiums, a couple of which are available in the DC area. Remember that even if your plan does not reimburse a portion of Medicare Part B premiums, it may offer cost-sharing waivers that can decrease your out-of-pocket costs. You should review these as part of your consideration, and all you need to know is in your brochures, and you know, look on the PCT. Um, Walt has some good information, but the brochure is the Bible. The brochure is the contractual statement of benefits that you purchase when you purchase an FEHP health plan. So I know I, I don't have that much time here. I got a lot left to talk about, but with regard to the COVID, uh, pandemic, OPM has taken multiple actions to safeguard the health and well-being of the federal workforce and annuitants during the pandemic. FEHB carriers must waive cost sharing and prior authoriza authorization requirements for COVID-19 diagnostic and antibody testing pursuant to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Securities Act called the CARES Act. OPM has also strongly encouraged all FEHB carriers to waive cost sharing and prior authorization requirements for telehealth or other remote care services associated with treatment of COVID-19. And that, that we've urged that, but that has also happened. The, the carriers that, that are covering the lion's share of the FEHB program and release are providing these waivers so people can seek appropriate care. The big one here, once an FDA approved vaccine becomes available for COVID-19, all FEHB carriers must rapidly cover it without any cost sharing in less than 15 business days in accordance with the CARES Act. Um, so that's what I have to say about FEHB. Moving on quickly to FedVIP, um, James mentioned it. During 2020, OPM completed a competitive application process for the Federal Employees Dental and Vision Program. For plan year 2021, OPM selected insurance carriers to provide comprehensive, accessible dental and vision coverage through FedVIP, 
effective January 1, 2021. These are annually negotiated contracts, but unlike FEHB, the act that actually established FedVIP said make it FEHB like, but our FEHB contracts are evergreen. The FedVIP contracts are only for seven years. That's a place where it's not FEHB like, where it might behoove us to, <laughs> to be FEHB like. But at any rate, uh, we have to renegotiate full contracts every seven years and have a full competition. Uh, we did that this year that resulted in some changes. Now, the majority of current FedVIP enrollees will experience little or no change in premiums. But FedVIP members should not assume their rating region and premium rates are the same in 2021. They may be different. We encourage enrollees and those who wish to look to review the rating regions and premium rates for 2021 FedVIP plans and look in the brochures, look on the Benefeds website. We haven't mentioned Benefeds before, B-E-N-E-F-E-D-S.com. That's the interface for making FedVIP changes and there'll be comprehensive information there. So we made some other beneficial changes to the program. FedVIP carriers now offer additional wellness focused services. I think in James, James mentioned how important wellness is. Um, they've increased benefits for those that are pregnant. They've increased benefits for children and for persons with chronic conditions such as diabetes. For 2021, I think James mentioned this as well, the number of FedVIP dental carriers will increase from 10 to 12. The number of vision carriers will increase from four to five. OPM anticipates no disruption of enrollees continuity of services because all prior contract period carriers will continue their participation in the program. There will be 23 dental plan options available across the program with 14 nationwide dental plan options available to each potential enrollee. There are 10 nationwide vision plan options available to all potential enrollees. Specific plan information on both dental and vision, as I've said, is on benefeds.com. Um, so just really quickly, with regard to FSA feds, this is a, a, a program that allows you to have a health clear flexible spending account and a dependent care flexible spending account. You can have both. There's all kinds of caveats on what, what you're allowed to have. It's only available to active employees because it's called the salary reduction program. You agree to take the money that you allot, your salary is reduced by a commensurate amount, but the money that you allot to your healthcare flexible spending account or your dependent care flexible spending account is not taxed. It's pre-taxed, so you get direct immediate tax savings and you can then use that money for the health side on, on IRS allowed healthcare expenses, on the dependent care side, on, on dependent care needed for a child or a parent. So, um, as in past years, I'll remind you here, federal employees are encouraged to consider the tax savings available, setting aside the amount projected to spend in out-of-pocket health, dental, and vision expenses in a flexible spending account saves you money. Participants, this is, this is something that changed as a result of COVID and it will go on now. Participants may now carry over up to $550 of unused amounts in their healthcare flexible spending account or their limited expense healthcare flexible spending account remaining at the end of 2020 into 2021. Again, the key dates, open season began today, it's begun, and open season ends December 14th. So to everybody watching who, who is a FEHB enrollee or potential enrollee, please go to the websites, look at the options that are available to you. These programs are designed to provide market choices that are driven by value, the best quality at the best price. We don't believe there is a bad choice in the program, but the best choice may be different for different enrollees in different circumstances. The programs work best when enrollees shop during the annual open season, and you now have the opportunity to shop until December 14. Do not wait until the last minute. Please review your options now. Thank you very much. Ed, great. Thank you so much. Let me just ask you a couple of questions before I turn it over to Walt. Um, for, first is, um, well, when is it advantageous to someone or when should someone think about using the flexible spending account? 
Like what, what's the typical typical scenario? If 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 you um have cost sharing, deductible, coinsurance, copayments, and you and you have a relative uh, knowledge that you're going to utilize certain health services during the year, you can set aside the amounts that you would pay out of pocket. You can you can elect that amount into your healthcare flexible spending account, and then every time you pay your fifty dollar copay or your 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 cost share on your prescription medication, you will be paying it with tax free money. And that so works for prescription drugs too. That works yes. for prescription drugs. Yes. Huh. So so I mean, it, it, the the issue is if you if you allot money into a healthcare flexible spending account or a dependent care and you end up not spending it, you can lose the money. So, so if someone hasn't done it before, they might wanna start conservatively and then see how that works out for them. And there's, there's some administrative thing too. You have, to do, you have to do a little bit that you weren't doing before. Now, we have paperless reimbursement though in most of our plans. Mm -hmm. and, and so with paperless reimbursement, it's automatic. You, you go to the doctor, you pay your cost share, the yeah. health plan processes the claim, sends it to our flexible spending account administrator, flexible spending account administrator, reimburses you your money from tax-free dollars. I see. You, you put the money up, but you get reimbursed. And so the people who are spending a lot of money on copay or deductible payments that they know they're going to have for prescription drugs, whatever, they should really look at this. Definitely, they should look sure. at it. That's yeah. the healthcare FSA. If they have young children, generally under the age of 13 or a, or a child, an older child that, that is not capable of caring for themselves in certain circumstances or some elderly. And it's, it's all based on IRS rules, but you can put money in a dependent care flexible spending account and the same deal. It's tax free money pays for that dependent care. And with, with, the, with the dependent care, it's pretty easy to know what the charge is going to be. And it's usually in excess of the IRS limit. So it's much safer in a way. Okay, I've got two other quick questions for you. One is, um, what percentage or fraction of the federal workforce will review and make a change in their health benefits plan in this open season period? I mean, I'm somebody who kind of, in all candor, I just kind of go with the flow. If I've chosen something and it seems to be working all right, I don't dive back in. But what percentage of the people get into it? And, and do you recommend that people who feel okay about where they are still review their materials and stuff. Yes, and I, 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 we've had stats historically that maybe five to seven percent of people actually make a change, and, and it could be a lot more than that that, that should make a change. Um, I think, and we've we've only recently had it the last five or six years. We've had better metrics on our website activity, and an astronomical number of people hit the website. So most of those, some of those might be, be researchers or others studying, but, but a lot of those are federal employees and annuitants who, who are looking, I guess, and deciding then not to switch. And that's something that we, we, we wanna get ever increasing data and better insight into in how to, to, to meet the demand for the, the people to receive the information to effectively shop. And then get okay. some insight into, more, greater insight. We have a lot of insight a greater insight into specifically why they make the choices that they do. Okay, one final question for you. I'm going to turn it over to Walt. Um, James mentioned that, um, that everybody has like a once in a lifetime or once in a career time opportunity to actually switch out of their current plan into a new plan in the middle of the year in the event of some crisis or emergency or something. And I wonder, I, I, I wasn't aware of that, and I wonder to what extent that, that should argue for people being more conservative or less expansive in the coverage they get, knowing that if something big happened, they'd be able to switch over. Well, I'm not, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure, James, what, I thought you were saying when someone becomes eligible for Medicare. What, 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 were, you, what were you saying there, James? Yeah, the, uh, the event code, you know, I think it's two L's in Lima on the OPM form 2809. It says upon becoming eligible, but from my experience, it's 
for the rest of that person's life. One lifetime opportunity. They don't have to do it at 65. They can do it anytime they want, once, because we've helped dozens of people every year make that change. And usually it's because, you know, I've been doing the basic plan for all these years. I don't worry about Adam Network. They don't cover Adam Network, but then boom, all of a sudden here I am in April and the doctor just diagnosed me with something. So James, if you don't get this major surgery, which by the way is out of your network, by next month, you're not gonna be alive next year. And 100% of those people have been successful to go to OPM, use that code and switch plans the first of the next month. So the once, they can do it once in their lifetime. Well, I, I, there, I don't know about that. There are, there are the, the, the annuitant office at OPM is the payroll office for annuitants across the federal government. So enrollment is done at the agency level for annuitants, OPM retirement service. Yeah, we're only talking about annuitants because right, right. it's not available for employees at all. Well, well, it's just for people who are Medicare beneficiaries. Is that it's right? for annuitants who are 65 or older, I see. period. Well, well but yeah, I, I think the, the annuitant office has, has the ability to, to, in some instances, of grant waivers, and they have the ability to do things in equity and good conscience. But it's not and even also, a waiver. It's, it's well, an I don't, I don't know. Form. <laughs> I, would, I, would have to, I would have to look into this. I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. I would have to look into this. That's okay, fine. but it's in very narrow circumstances. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. All right, good. I appreciate that. Walt, let's uh, turn it over to you. And thank you so hey, much thanks. for all your hard work. These guys are so good. I'm not sure they've taken away most of it. I have a long list of talking points and I keep checking them off as they get used up. Uh, but a couple of points and then I'll delve into some stuff the others haven't mentioned. Uh, I like to think of dividing your decision process and open season into two parts. One of the parts is for those who, even if you're satisfied with the plan you're in, even if you're like a certain lazy congressman who says, I'm happy as a clam where I am, that's okay. But at least spend half an hour thinking about your health situation and your families. Look at the brochure for the plan you're in and think about is, is there something changing that's, that could be adverse to us or is there some, any other aspect of it, is it gonna cover me well next year? And I'll get a little more into how you do that. And just do a little bit of due diligence homework about your situation. Now, one of the really wonderful things about this program is that there is a brochure written in actual plain English. Okay. Uh, they're usually 100 pages long, but you don't have to read every page for every plan in the program. They are PDF files. You can get them by calling the plan, but you can go on the website of any plan, including your plan, or to the OPM website or to the checkbook website, wherever you do, get the brochure for the plan you're in, and you look at section two. It's called How the Plan Changes for 2021. It's about a page long or less. And it, that a quick glance at that page will help you, uh-oh, they used to cover hearing aids and now they don't, or you know they're raising the deductible and I wanna think twice about that. Or maybe there's a new benefit that you say, wow, this makes me really want to stay in this plan, but whatever, get a little bit of information. It, you could do this for your plan in five minutes or less. Also look at two other really key pages. If almost everyone should take a look at the page on non-FEHB benefits. James mentioned this, it's an important page. It's the silver sneakers program, <laughs> you know, uh, the gym program or whatever, but it also includes huge often an unofficial dental benefit that most people, you know, if you turn to the dental section, most plans say we don't have a benefit except in case of an accident that break that busts your mouth up, but they have an unofficial benefit that gets you discounts at participating providers. So you have that set of dental options in addition to those in the FedVIP program. The third thing, and it's vital for annuitants who are over age 65, Section nine of the brochure includes, uh, and Ed pointed, mentioned this, we're all, we're all, the three of us are on the same wavelength. Go look at how the plan coordinates with Medicare for next year. And you may be pleasantly surprised, okay? But, you, or, and it may be just old news to you, not new news, but it's worth checking out. So do spend that half an hour on homework. It's, it's costless. Now, the bigger topic to me is thinking about plan change. And the first thing I want to tell you is, 
that there, we calculate, based, we have knowledge from OPM of how many people are enrolled in each plan. And it turns out that the majority of feds, both employees and annuitants, are enrolled in plans that are not the better or best buys. And this means that in general, you can save between one and $2,000 a year by changing plans. Most people can do this. Well, that's like getting, I think you, the Congressman mentioned uh, a three and a half percent pay raise. Well, you know, if your pay, if your pay is, they pick a number, 80 grand a year, 3% of that's $2,400. It's a, it's like giving yourself an extra pay raise. Hmm. So worth comparing at least a few plans to, to decide if you can do better. Uh, if you're very unfrisky about all this, you could compare just the plans by the company you're in that you like. Blue Cross uh, has uh, four different plans in the DC metro area, three nationally and one local, Care First. Actually, several Care First plans. Okay, so there's four or five plans. Take a look at the Blue Cross plans if you a Blue Cross fan. GIA has about five or six plans, okay? It's got, and if you're in GIA High, that's a very expensive plan. GIA Standard is, has been a pretty good plan for many years, but now there are two different GIA plans uh, that, are, that were new just a year or two ago, uh, and it's a GIA High Deductible plan. If you like GIA, take a look at the other GIA plans. United and Edna do the same thing. They have multiple plans. There are lots of choices. Kaiser has three choices. Um, so at least look at other plans your carrier offers. Now, a couple of things I could say about best buys across the board. Very few people look at high deductible plans. That is a terrible error. They have the lowest premiums. They have uh, excellent benefits, wonderful catastrophic coverage, most you can pay out of pocket. Uh, they give you a health savings account, which is a true investment vehicle. Uh, it's better than, it's an IRA on steroids. You, you put money into this account tax-free, you can invest it and it grows tax-free. And if 20 years later, it's grown to say 20 or 30,000 bucks and you have a health emergency, you can take money out tax-free. It's just, you know, uh, a choice everyone ought to consider. The brochures do an excellent job of describing that, be that benefit and how that kind of plan works. It's so easy just to pick up a brochure and read that little section on how the plan works for a high deductible plan. Um, there are also a set of plans called consumer driven and they're similar. They have a different kind of savings account. It's not unlike the high deductible plans. It's not a health savings account that belongs to you. So if you join the a APWU or, or NALC uh, consumer driven plan, you don't get to keep the money if you later change plans and haven't used it. But nonetheless, that money can build up and you're getting a better premium deal and an excellent catastrophic benefit. Um, if you just want to think in terms of conventional insurance and don't want to be frisky at all, a very good plan for anyone to look at next year is the GIHA Elevate plan. Its premiums were level, no increase from last year. It was a good buy to begin with. It's a conventional plan. It's actually GIHA is now a, quote, national plan, similar to uh, uh, the Blue Cross basic and standard options. Uh, and it has two Elevate plans, but the one the, of the two, the, the better buy is just the plain Elevate. Uh, but Blue Cross has a really good plan that a lot of people don't even know exists, also a couple of years old. And that's the Blue Cross FEP plan. And uh, you could look at that plan or at the Elevate is Elevate plan, this could be done in five or 10 minutes. And you can, and be sure to calculate how much you think you might save in premiums for sure. Um, one of the things the checkbook does in our guide, and I, I commend our, 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 our product for this purpose, we actually calculate for every health plan in the system, how much you are likely to be out of pocket if you enroll in that plan, taking into account the for sure expense of the premium, and the uncertain expense of what your healthcare out-of-pocket costs may be, depending on whether or not you have a good year where costs are low, a high cost year or an average year. And we find that if you compare plans for a family of a particular size, the pay system you're in, whether or not you're retired, whether or not you have 
Medicare Part A or Parts A and B. Cover, we cover all the, and your health status, we cover all the common situations and almost all the uncommon ones. And we actually tell you that in Plan A, you're likely to save two grand or three grand compared to Plan Q, okay? And we give, we rate the plans and array them in that order, okay? So it's very easy to use. We also allow all the same kinds of comparisons that OPM allows, and I cannot commend the importance of the quality ratings, uh, you know, which, which plans have higher and lower deductibles, which plans cover uh, dental or which, covers, which cover hearing aids or chiropractic, whatever the benefit is that concerns you. One of the important examples is if you're gonna have a baby next year, most plans, but not all, have a close to zero cost for maternity deal. Uh, Ed already mentioned something they all have now by government edict, which is a coronavirus uh, benefit. And by the way, for those who haven't seen the news yet, one of the major vaccine creators just announced today that they have a vaccine that has been found. The first round of scientific review is in that is effective for a 90% plus rate, rate of preventing you catching the virus. And the government has already paid uh, for hundreds of millions of doses of this vaccine, as well as the government put bets on a wide range of vaccines. So we're gonna see probably, maybe even in November, but certainly by December, the first chance most of us have to get a vaccine. Uh, and that's just great news. And it's great news. We're, we're, it, we'll be living with this virus for a few years yet. But if we can get the death and serious illness rate down to close to zero, and I think we can, if we get enough of the people uh, uh, vaccinated, a big, a big task lies ahead. Uh, so that's great news. Back, back on plan comparisons, you get that in any plan. So uh, all you need to do is when the vaccine becomes readily available, there'll be some priorities for medical personnel and for school teachers and elderly in nursing homes. But, but We'll all have a shot at it within a few months. Um, other plans to think about, uh, if you're willing to join an HMO, you can't go wrong with any of the three Kaiser plan options. Uh, United Choice Primary and Edna Open Access Basic, we also rate as very good buys. The point I wanna make here is you can say, I do or do not wanna join an HMO. I do or not, or do not wanna have a plan that lets me go out of network and pays at least something towards that. Whatever constraints are on you, I wanna plan that my doctors at the network, really important. Um, checkbook does provide for the DC area. We tell you which doctors, you could you enter the doc, doc Smith or Doc Sawbones, you enter the name, as part of your telling us how old you are and how big is your family and a few other things. And we will tell you which plans your doctor is in. But I wanna reemphasize something James said, you do need to call the doctor's offices to make sure they'll be in that plan come January 1st. They, mm -hmm. they may be dropping out. Um, people with Medicare. Let me say first, there's this choice that you would get. Most of us at age 65, though if you're still working, you can defer it. Do I or do I not sign up for Part B? It's the to be or not to be question. Uh, and it's a huge question. Uh, if you sign up for Part B, you're paying two premiums. And uh, for, for a single person, self only, the premiums are gonna be around $2,000 a year. Next year, the Medicare Part B, Part B premium will be about uh, four, uh, almost $1,800, $1,780, if my memory serves correctly. Just Premium was just announced a couple of days ago. Well, that's close to 2,000 bucks. And for a couple, it's close to 4,000 bucks. And you're already paying probably three or four grand for that couple for an FEHB plan, self plus one. The question is, why do you need both? And the answer is you don't, okay? But there is some benefit to having both. One of the benefits, and I think the important one, is that it lets you go out of network um, because Medicare will be primary once you're retired and over 65 and in both parts of Medicare, or you don't have to, for Medicare's point of view, you just need part B to go, be, go to any Medicare participating doctor and pay no more than the Medicare rate. That's huge for some people. Um, so flexibility outside plan networks is a big benefit of part, parts A and B. Most plans, and I'm back to something Ed said, but I would just 
say it with uh, more emphasis, most plans give you what we call the Medicare wraparound benefit. You will pay little or nothing for hospital and doctor bills if you have both parts A and B. Now, this is not usually a huge saving. I mean, how big is your deductible? 100 bucks, 200 bucks. What's a doctor visit cost? 30 bucks. How many doctor visits are going to have next year, even if you have bad luck? And the answer is you won't have enough probably to pay to, to offset the cost of the Part B premium. That said, it cuts, the, it cuts the cost quite a bit. And a couple of plans have a Part B premium rebate. The important one of these, I think, for most people to think about is Blue Cross Basic, which pays $800 towards your, per person towards your Part B premium. So that cuts the cost of having duplicate coverage a lot. Um, hey, Walt, um, for, forgive me, we're gonna have to um, close it up in two minutes. Can I just ask you two quick questions? Sure, and I'm done. I've covered my main topics. <laughs> no, my, my first question is, uh, you, you've mentioned the brochures as an excellent resource. Uh, do we all get brochures sent to us from our, from OPM or the current plan or how does that work? I'm not sure I've seen the one. The plan will send you the brochure of the plan you're in, but it's actually better to use the, and that's a paper copy. It's easier and better to use the electronic copy because okay. you can put a word like maternity or hearing aids or chiropractic. Uh, and you can look at any of the brochures easily. And you just have to, you know, click the name of the plan and boom, the brochure is in front of your eyeball. Okay, and so where, where do you go for that, Ed? Did you want to say something? Yeah, on opm.gov, healthcare insurance, plan compare, you put in your zip code, it tells you the plan's available. There's a link to the brochure for every plan, link to the provider directory, link to the plan's website, et cetera. And Walt Perfect. will tell you he's also got it with his checkbook stuff. And he yeah, does. We, we do exactly the same thing as OPM. And the, uh, our website is www.guide to health plans, all one word, guide to health plans.org. And let me mention, our, it's not free. Uh, it costs, I think, 11, roughly $11 to get the electronic version, which is the one you want. But there is a discount for NARF members. Uh, okay. And I want to mention this NARF has cut a deal with us. NARF 20 is the special code for getting the NARF discount. So, all right. Well, th that's, that's wonderful. I am so grateful to all of you. This has been just a, a super abundance of great information. I'm encouraging everybody to go to these websites and we're going to print that out. So it's available for everybody at the end of this uh, uh, discussion. So you'll know exactly wh where to go for the websites to do the comparative analysis. And thank you for encouraging me, uh, Walt, to be uh, more serious and rigorous about it and not just falling back on uh, my prior choices because everybody really should re-examine it the way that you do a checkup on your health care. You should do a checkup on your health plans to make sure you're making the financially best choices for your family. James Marshall, Ed Hardy, Walt Francis, thank you so much uh, as always for your help for my constituents in the 8th District and thank, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Best of luck, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you guys.